welcome to the Classical Gap Fest, a weekly discussion about the ever-changing world of classical music. I'm your host for this week, Kensha Watanabe, and with me as always are Tiffany Liu and William White. This week, we'll be discussing a new music initiative by the Sphinx organization, then we'll watch a music video from Daniil Trifonov, and finally, we'll talk about classical music being used as an anti-vagrancy weapon. But first, we'd like to start with our prelude segment. So Will, what do we have today? This week, we'll be playing a round of everyone's favorite game, Game of Pairs. All right, here's how this game is played. I've chosen two composers who share a similar musical style, and I'm going to play three selections that my co-hosts will listen to and try to guess who wrote each one of them. This week's composers are Felix Mendelssohn and Robert Schumann. Cool. <laughs> but before we get into the game, let's briefly discuss what makes these composers' styles similar and different. Well, we have two composers here who are both very representative of like the early to mid romantic romantic German landscape, symphonic landscape, with them both also contributing fairly substantially in the realms of piano music, solo piano music, and Mendelssohn had a greater chamber music output, I think, slightly, but Schumann made up for that by living for a longer time. Songs. <laughs> yeah, songs, and also like Strim and Drang, right? There's this kind of like yeah. high drama kind of energy that comes with some of their, their works. It's not all that, but... I guess the one kind of off-road would be that Mendelssohn has this kind of religious aspect to some of his music. Let's say we heard something that was a little bit more like looking back, like let's say That's there right. was a yeah, fugue in the religious or tradition. something. Yes, then right. it would more likely be Mendelssohn rather That's than right. Schumann. I'm just That's trying to true. think of like how we would suss out. These. Yeah, so other uh, other things, you know, texturally they're not dissimilar, but sometimes in his orchestral writing, Schumann will write things that are orchestrationally kind of a little odd. I mean, we'll, some of them, some people will go so far as to call them mistakes. You know, this this, this doubling matter where he where he makes people play more notes in order to get more volume, but it doesn't necessarily always Always, you know, have that effect that appears in his symphonic writing. And then the other thing, this is much, much vaguer, but especially if we get into early year Mendelssohn, the stuff for which he's famous, that stuff has like this irrepressible joy and youth to it that I do not find is present in most of Schumann's writing. And for good reason. I mean, the guy had, you know, dealt with mental health issues all his life and died a really tragic death. But, uh, Schumann stuff, when it's happy, it seems wistful happy, sad happy. <laughs> and Mendelssohn stuff, when it's sad, it seems like religious solemn sad, not mm. sad sad. <laughs> so yeah. so it's a it's a vibe that I kind of get from these two composers. But hey, Will may prove us wrong. Let's see. All right. Very interesting, folks. Uh, let's see how you do. Here is your first excerpt. <laughs> What do you think? Mendelssohn? Yeah, I, I think this is very much in the Mendelssohn style yes. in that the busybodiness of the, the, the piano writing too is just always like, I don't know. That is a hallmark of about. Mendelssohn's piano yeah. writing, especially in his chamber works, which I would count cello sonatas as kind of part of yeah. that world. Yeah. Like we know that his piano part in his most famous piano chamber works, which are the trio, uh, the D major, the D minor trio, is like insanely hard to play, right? Like at least twice as difficult, if not more, <laughs> than either of the string parts. And this this tracks with that. And so does the last observation that I was making about like, there's just something really irrepressible, right? Like a, a tunefulness. You can tell, and we heard a little bit of what must have been the opening tune for that movement at the end there. Dun, da, da, dun, ba, da, ba, 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 ba. That's Mendelssohn. Uh, or we're about to be shocked. Or we're, or, or we're really about to eat it here, but... No, you guys are spot on. This is Mendelssohn. This is his second cello sonata, last movement. Good stuff. Yeah, very nice. All right, here's your second uh, excerpt here. <laughs>
This is Schumann, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first thing I think is that my arm starts to hurt when I hear those <laughs> violins having to squeeze in four, you know, strokes in each, you know, those like tre almost tremolo, like, you know, yeah. that's, that's very much Schumann. Coming from just having done Schumann 1, uh, yeah. it's a lot of that all the time. Yeah, and there's a giveaway moment very close to the, you were, I think you were listening towards the end of that excerpt, but there's a dead giveaway, where he doubles that, where, you know, a, a Mendelssohn, Mendelssohnian approach to that might have just been to just have them slur it. Ya -da -da -dum. But actually, even just that little chromatic figure, that's, that's very Schumann itself. That's not really Mendelssohn. There's something that, like, Schumann enjoys these kind of chromatic motif, mot motivic developments where he'll take, like, a little cell of something and kind of riff on that for a couple of bars. Like, he'll, he'll do a sequence with that. That Mendelssohn, I don't know, it's not that Mendelssohn doesn't do sequences, but they're always tuneful. And that's not something that I associate necessarily with, with Schumann's orchestral Yeah, writing there's something about, like, working in harmonic blocks. Yes. Like they're, they're, they're bigger blocks that are somehow connected some in some motific way, but right. it's not necessarily melody that takes us there, let's say. That's that right. maybe Mendelssohn is a little bit more um, apt to do. Yeah. Once again, you are correct. Very, very well reasoned. Very good. What is this piece? Yeah. Okay. So that's, <laughs> I was hoping you would ask that. This is uh, a piece by Robert Schumann called the Julius Caesar Overture. Huh. Yeah. That's what I thought too. <laughs> exactly. No. I like it. I want to hear more. Yeah. Maybe yeah, it's not as interesting afterwards, but what I heard seemed cool. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's, it's a pretty cool piece. I love Schumann's uh, overtures, like the Genovevo mm -hmm. overture. You know, mm -hmm. I love. I mean, I did, and I had not known it until the very moment I sat down to read it in context, and I was like, "This piece is dope. Mm -hmm. It's so cool." Anyway, and the Manfred too, right? Is that mm -hmm. the one? Of also, the one. I listened to that because of the because the of the Bernstein, Bernstein script. script. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was, I was listening to it while reading yeah. the script. You know, I, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, that's a fine piece. I, don't, I don't think that's nearly as good as this. Quite honestly, I, yeah. I, think, I think this true should have a more standard uh, place in the repertoire. All right, folks. Uh, so we've got one Mendelssohn, one Schumann. Now we come to our third excerpt. This is always where it gets interesting. Here you go. <laughs> If I'm going to stick with what I said earlier about how Mendelssohn perhaps is a little bit more toward the classical side, let's say, than Schumann is, then this harm the harmonies that we heard, the crunchiness of these harmonies would point me in the direction of Schumann. But I don't right. know, Tiff, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, we hear kind of a repeated augmented chord there that does like that is a chord that Schumann kind of enjoys leaning into often, I think. Mm -hmm. But then I was trying to think of like, have I heard Mendelssohn do that ever? And I don't, I, I couldn't think of any. Well, I don't know about that. But I was also trying to think like, do I actually know any vocal orchestral works by Schumann? Mm. I'm not sure that I do, which by no means, I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm just putting my own ignorance on blast here was essentially <laughs> what I'm doing. But I can name at least a couple by Mendelssohn. And my German is non-existent so I couldn't understand anything except for Jungling which is a word that they both love so I couldn't discern whether the subject was religious or not which I, I guess I assume it is because this this feels to me like you know kind of oratorio-esque where there's like a it's like a quasi recitative section right what yeah. we have here which seems to suggest a Morris religious-ish subject so I'm, I'm not sure here I'm not sure I say you pick one and I pick the other and we'll see who's right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, your reasoning is, is absolutely sound, and it, it almost convinces me to pick Mendelssohn here. But let's let's cover our basis and say it. I'll say Schumann. Okay, you I'll say go Mendelssohn. with Mendelssohn, and you go Schumann. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, um, <laughs> Kencho, I'm uh, happy to tell you that you've won uh, this uh, this round of oh, game fairs. This, this is non-competitive game. <laughs> yeah, this is Sh well. You made it. You made you made it that way. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is in fact Schumann. This is from his secular oratorio. 
Mm. Das Paradies und die Peri. So this is based on a, I guess it's based on an Irish poet, uh, his version of a Persian folk tale that was translated into German. I don't know. It's got kind of a <laughs> torture Whoa. genesis. But yeah, it is, uh, you know, and that was the feint that I was kind of making is that, you know, this is not a very well-known piece. Schumann's oratorios, of which I, this is not the only one, but, you know, he's mm. not known, uh, obviously, for any kind of um, vocal, dramatic orchestral writing, whereas Mendelssohn obviously has Elijah, St. Paul, Christus, that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah, the harmonies, I thought, were the giveaway that lean into that first chord that kept happening. Very much an anticipation of Wagner. And in fact, Wagner did praise this work. So, um, you know, the music of the future here with uh, Robert Schumann. That just about does it for this week's Prelude segment. But before we wrap up, we'd like to remind our listeners that we do periodic listener-generated Name That Tune rounds. So we invite you to try to stump us. Check our show notes where you'll find a link to the form where you can upload a 30-second clip of an unidentified piece of classical music for us to try to identify. And with that, we move on to our first topic. Tiffany, what do you have for us? As reported on the music blog I Care If You Listen, the American Composers Forum, or ACF, in partnership with the Juilliard School's Preparatory Division and the New York Philharmonic, has been selected by the Sphinx organization as recipient of a 2022 Sphinx Venture Fund grant in the amount of $100,000. The winning program, named Composing Inclusion, will commission nine composers who identify as Black and or Latinx to create, quote, flexible or adaptable scores for different musical levels in collaboration with the young and seasoned musicians. Composing Inclusion will connect student composers from the New York Philharmonic Very Young Composers Program, or VYC, and nine composers selected by the American Composers Forum. These composers will be commissioned to create new works for a variety of ensemble types, and it will result in five orchestral pieces, one string quartet, one woodwind quintet, one brass quintet, and one percussion ensemble piece. The works will be premiered by the New York Philharmonic and Juilliard Prep students, and they will be published and shared with professional ensembles throughout the country. All nine composers will be selected and commissioned in 2022 and 23, with the first premiere taking place in New York in an upcoming season. Okay, so some interesting threads to pull at here. What do we think of the winning programs? And I'd also like to discuss the other uh, Sphinx Venture Fund winners. But before we get into that, what do we think of the project and what do we hope to see from it, I think, more importantly? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's unalloyed good. Um, I think that one thing to even just get by way of introduction here is to talk about what the Sphinx organization is. This is a Detroit-based foundation, the goal of which is to promote the work of Black and Latin musicians in the field of classical music. And they do this through a variety of ventures. They have some big high profile competitions. You know, that's that's one big thing is like you can win one of these concerto competitions. And then they do a lot of stuff with the composers, as we're seeing here. But I, I actually was not aware that they give out these kind of big grants for programs like this. And that Sphinx has grown in the 25 years of its history to an organization that could be awarding grants to the New York Philharmonic is really saying something about uh, about what they have been able to accomplish. So that's pretty cool. What I think is neat about this particular initiative and, and the reason that I thought that it would be a, an interesting topic for discussion is that it's asking composers to do something that they don't often do, which is to create music envisioning it from its conception in a way that it could be retooled for ensembles at the highest professional level and then at more basic student levels and that's just not something that composers are asked to do very much you know uh, composers like like somebody like me in terms of my training like we're told to be extremely specific, you know, and like you want to write really particularly for like the players and the ensemble and the instruments that you're going to write for. But in the world of educational music, you know, there's all of this stuff called like flex scores, you know, because like at a school band someplace in, in like a rural community, 
you know, you might not have the full instrumentation of like a, a, a major wind ensemble, right? So, you know, you write it so that like the oboe parts are all being doubled in the second clarinet or whatever, you know, in case you don't have those players. And this is going to ask composers to think along those lines. And I don't think it's something that you would want to ask a composer to do every day of the week, but it's cool. It's, it's, it's a nice structure to, to, to have serious composers really have to think about. Yeah, I'll say that in the world of educational music, this kind of level-oriented flex ensemble writing is pretty common because there are, and I've done them, string arrangements, for example, of like, here is a part, a second violin part, for somebody who literally just picked up the violin last week. Mm -hmm. Only open strings. And then here is the other second violin part for people who know how to play in first position only. And then here is the version of the second violin part that where people can shift into third position. That's not uncommon. So I think that the style of this kind of writing is taking its cue from something that has been present in the educational realm for a number of years now, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just say that, you know, keep in mind that this is not some, you know, non-reputable music school that's being latched onto this, right? This is the Ju Juilliard pre-college. So even the nine-year-old kids that are there can play at a pretty high level. So it's not like they have to completely dumb it down. What I found really interesting is that because, you know, you talk about this kind of flexibility, Will, the end result is very specific in that it has to be a string quartet and a woman quintet and a brass quintet. And there's no, it doesn't even allow for kind of like mixing of instrument groups in a way that I think it's kind of limiting for composers, don't you think? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, because th there are those specific ones, you know, certain a certain composer is going to be assigned to the, the brass quintet and a certain composer is going to be assigned to the percussion ensemble, right? But I think it's what four or five composers are going to be assigned to orchestra music. And those people, I think, are going to have to make versions that have some of this kind of flex instrumentation. And it's not just the Juilliard pre concert. Yeah, the Juilliard pre concert, I think, is going to be premiering some of the versions of these pieces. But I think that the idea behind this is that uh, the third partner here, aside from uh, the Phil and Juilliard Prep is the American Composers Forum. And my understanding is that they are going to use some of their muscle and their publishing outpost to disseminate these pieces to other communities. And specifically, they're going to target communities where there is a professional organization that has relationships with educational institutions you know so like i don't know they might send it to the dayton philharmonic and then get like the dayton youth orchestra or maybe you know it's like an all city orchestra to come together i mean that's i think where you would really see some more need for this kind of a, a flex thing and um you know tiffany when you were talking about the flex model the composer who I really think of, the one like, you know, serious canonic classical composer who I think did do this in a real way is Benjamin Britten. Mm -hmm. He wrote those like sort of church plays where like, yeah, you could be a third violin player and only play the open strings of, of the instrument. I guess for me, the the cool thing, because I, I, got, I went through the prep school of Juilliard mm -hmm. in which I think I played one piece by a living composer. And it was Eric Awazin. Huh. Uh, and it was Oh, and it was Awazin of all people. And it was Awazin who huh. was like who taught at Juilliard. And uh -huh. you know, this is great in terms of, you know, exposing these students to not just, you know, like we always say, the, the, the all the dead white guys, right? And this is just like something that's much more living and breathing, and they're part of a process that is bigger than just the school because then they see the works that they've been working on or being exposed to be performed by the New York Phil or elsewhere. So I love this kind of continuity. I think that this proposal could have just as well involved the conservatory, like the Juilliard school students. But the fact that they actually targeted the prep division, I think, is um, is really great. Yeah, it's very clearly an educational, it's directed at the educational realm and not just because one of the things about performing a lot of music by living composers is it tends to be too hard. And so if the brief is to, to, to produce something that people actually can and want to play, I mean, you know, forget too hard. It's often like hard to learn also. It doesn't, it doesn't glue itself into your ear. You don't come away with a melody that you're humming right out of rehearsal. And so I think we may see some you know, maybe we'll see a little bit of romanticism that gets infused into these works, or maybe we'll see something groovy. But at least, you know, one of my one of my composer friends says it needs to have something that's memorable in it from the first listen. Right, I agree. And to that to that point, it's going to be very interesting and important 
which composers are chosen for this. And I think that maybe the approach is not to pick from the echelon of composers who are most commonly working, you know, with like that the New York Philharmonic might commission otherwise. They're going to need to do some research and figure out who is writing music that could appeal to a professional orchestra and a student ensemble as well. But you know what I actually think is going to be the great tempering on the uh, temptation of any kind of industry ensconced composer who might wish to fly off the handle with some sort of esoterica is the fact that they are involving this very young composers program. Mm -hmm. It's it's not Mm -hmm. exactly clear the structure in which they describe it, but there's going to be feedback sessions. I presume that uh, I, okay, first of all, it's it's hilarious that when we say young composers, I suppose we generally mean those in their like 20s and 30s. <laughs> and so we have to have this extra designation for composers who are mm, in elementary or middle school or yeah, high school yeah. who are designated as very young composers. Very cute, I will have to say. Mm. But the fact that they are going to get substantial periods in which they will not only get to ask questions, hopefully, of the of the ACF composers, but also volunteer their own feedback on elements of the compositions as they are being composed. I hope that that's going to have the great tempering effect <laughs> on anything that might be too, evoke too much of the avant-garde that, <laughs> that most of us dislike about contemporary classical music. Right. Um, and hopefully find some ways of expressing that avant-garde that might actually be you know, accessible to youth orchestras, which is hard. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think that I think that they would be smart to look at like faculty in like state schools, people and people who have experience writing for educational ensembles or maybe one or two things from like the film realm, because that is, I think, where you do find examples of the avant garde being used in a compelling way that people actually like. Well, um, I think we can take a second to look at the other two winners, the two kind of big winners. So to zoom back out again, Sphinx uh, is an organization trying to power social change through classical music, broadly speaking. And this Sphinx Venture Fund is part of a project where over five years, they're planning to invest 1.5 million uh, into various music projects that uh, dot the landscape here. And so the other two big winners, uh, other than this composing inclusion project are the Nina Simone piano competition, uh, which will be based in Cincinnati and involve the Cincinnati Youth Orchestra as well as the um, symphony, of course. And Will, maybe you you might have some insight into those institutions and why this would or would not make a good addition to the landscape because it is it would be their inaugural competition. They won $100,000. And then the other winner was the New York City Opera's Duncan Williams Voice Competition, which of course is going to be based in New York City uh, to the tune of 97,000. And both of these are open to expressly highlight artists of color and repertoire by composers of color. Well, yeah, um, I I did used to work for the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and and I was the conductor of their youth orchestra. You know, the thing about Cincinnati is they have a piano competition there, or at least they did. They call it the World Piano Competition. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if that's still going on. I I don't know if maybe that architecture is taking over, you know, and sort of being reborn as the Nina Simone Piano Competition. I mean perfect person to name your competition <laughs> after. I mean, she's she's amazing in so many realms. And, you know, I mean, we think of her as this, like, mainly a jazz performer and, uh, you know, somebody who did protest music and stuff like that. But, like, she had serious classical training. And, and you hear that in her <laughs> playing a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah, Cincinnati is a good place for it. it um, I, I'm, I'm pro this. I think that sounds good. What do you think about the, uh, the opera thing, Kencha? I'm glad that New York City Opera is back in a way where they can start doing this again because yeah. it was a little rocky for them before. It's it? been nothing but rocky, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, yeah, and maybe zooming out even you know further with this is that, like you said, it's kind of amazing that Sphinx has grown to a point where it's now giving out grants, but it's actually kind of also a logical progression in their kind of game plan in terms of enacting social change through their organization, but now actually branching out to other organizations that may align with their own beliefs and handing out the funds to be able to kind of propagate all of that. And it, it should kind of speed up the process that they've already started for the last 25 years now that they have this capital to give out for, um, because if you, if you look at the website too, they kind of list out certain things that they would deem to be like a you know interesting project for them to fund. And it's a lot of just competitions that highlight 
you know, artists of color and all this stuff. So these two competitions make sense. It falls in line with what they're, what they're looking for. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what other projects they'll uh, continue to fund that goes beyond the idea of just competitions. One thing that I do notice, and I did misspeak earlier, it's not the Cincinnati Youth Orchestra, but it is CCM, mm -hmm. the conservatory. Mm. And so all three of these projects, in fact, with uh, with the city, New York City Opera and Manhattan School of Music teaming mm. up for, the, for that final prize, feature robust collaborations between institutions of higher learning and professional organizations, which I think we like to see. I don't know. It seems it seems to be a way to make sure we have both the integrity of pursuing something that is kind of true to our form, but also something that will sell, for lack of a better phrasing of that. I mean, something that is both industry relevant and kind of mission relevant. Okay. Well, we'll keep tabs on what is produced by all three of these projects, frankly, but um, but with a particular eye on the composing inclusion project. And uh, let us know what you think, listeners. Let's go to our second topic of the day, Kensho. The Art of the Fugue is an incomplete work of Johann Sebastian Bach, written in the last decade of his life. The work has no specified instrumentation and consists of 14 fugues and four canons, all stemming from one musical theme. The 14th fugue, named Fuga a Tre Soggetti, was left incomplete, breaking off in the middle of its third section. Since Bach's death, musicologists and performers alike have tried their hand at completing this fugue. Pianist Daniel Trifonov has added his own completion of the fugue as part of a new album released by Deutsche Grammophon entitled The Art of Life. A music video for this track has also been released, directed by Michael Joseph McQuilkin, which is what we'll be discussing on this segment. As always, a link to the video will be posted in the show notes. So let's hear a clip. to unpack here, of course, uh, based on what we saw, but let's just talk about the art of the fugue itself and this kind of incomplete stuff, because it's, it's a kind of an interesting background to that as well, right? So there's talk that, isn't there like an inscription in the autograph, right, where the thing breaks off that says, you know, I think Carl Philip Emanuel Bach writes, like, after writing this section, the composer died or something, and now, like, people are a little bit unsure as to whether or not that's true. There's a theory that Bach intentionally left it un incomplete to kind of entice composers to elaborate and complete his own fugue. So yeah, what do you guys think? Where is the AI completion of this? <laughs> 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 I ask that as a legitimate question mm -hmm. because like, yeah. you know, if we're going to talk about a, a composer that is more associated with various ideals of mathematics in a pretty specific way, I dare most people to come up with a name before Bach. Yeah, even even the fact that like, so this, the 14th contrapunctus, that's important. Bach had these numbers. They were like these Bach numbers. And 14 is a very important one. Because if you do this thing called, oh, there's a term for it, uh, gematria, which is when you assign a number to every letter in the alphabet, if you assign 2 to B, 1 to A, etc., and you add B, A, C, H, that gives you 14. So that was a very important number in Bach's like, output. And then if you put J, S, Bach, that becomes 41. So it's the reverse of 14. Whoa. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so people think that there's this like special importance to the fact that you know it's the 14th contrapunctus. And more than that, like, so here's the thing. The Art of the Fugue, right? You've got these four canons and these 14 fugues. They are all based on the same musical subject, except for this number 14, which starts with a totally new subject. It has three subjects. So it's, it has the first one, and then the second one also is not the same subject as all the rest of them. And then the third one is B-A-C-H, which is his name in musical notes. H being the B natural. Right, People being B natural, score. the German system. Yeah, exactly. Right. So where he left it off, and this is what has made this 
theory sort of compelling about that, like this was a puzzle to be solved, either by a human being or an, an AI, which I'm sure <laughs> Bach envisioned, envisioned, is that he was just about to combine the three subjects that had been. And then if you, th there is a logical extension of this, where if you look at the main subject of all the other fugues and canons in the, you know, the art of the fugue, like the main art of the fugue subject, it clearly can be laid over these three. Like it can mathematically go together. So it seems like he's building up to this grand statement that's going to like tie the whole thing together, you know, and it's it's in this most important 14th contrapunctus. And so maybe we can talk about like how we think that this is musically, but I think that we are so far from the point. I know. Because the point of this is the how music video. <laughs> bizarre and crazy and unintentionally hilarious this music video is and like what is going on with this man's fingernails and <laughs> you know like <laughs> why are we watching him like hang out with mushrooms in the woods i mean this is like we got to get to it okay so i mean who wants to describe just i mean you you basically did it but i mean i, I feel oh, like oh no, I, I i just i just skimmed the surface <laughs> so we, we need a little bit more about all right it. so the obviously the music video centers around daniel trifonov and him playing the piano but it's done in a very kind of weird I, I don't even know how to describe it it's kind of like a typical scene of like a composer working in this kind of like dingy like room and then there's like weird pages of like yeah he's, sheet he's music taped up he's taped up pages all over his wall i mean it's like it's a very unabomber it's like they try to recreate like beautiful mind you know what it reminded me of did you guys did you guys see this um this comedy special on Netflix from Bo Burnham called Inside? I watched like thirty minutes of that. And I couldn't. I yeah, couldn't do it but do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Like in terms it's of the vibe, vibe, the aesthetic. Yeah, that's you know, it's the like vibe. it's like shut. You know, it's it's like has a very pandemic. You know, like lockdown kind of a thing. Like, okay, I'm I'm all alone. I'm like the mad artist. You know, and and I'm just gonna like work out. You know, box final ideas and I'm going to solve this puzzle and he's like acting like this sort of madman pacing back and forth across the room and going back to the taped up manuscript sheets that are on the wall and he's just going crazy and, the, and all the windows you know the curtains are all shut and it's all dark and he's playing the piano and then he goes outside well then like the reason for the reason for going outside was like what like he he just saw like bits and pieces of his ideas like out on the it was like almost like Hansel and Gretel or something right like he was like picking up bits and pieces of his like manuscript or whatever and then suddenly like the next shot is him like trying to compose with like dirt you know yes, like and rearranging leaves. like leaves and stuff yes. like and then uh. and then he's writing he's got a sheet of manuscript paper out there outside on the on the mushroom log and he's and he's writing and what he's writing it's like He's writing like a whole rest and like, you know, a half. I mean, it is the most basic thing. It's like that dude who was looking for the uh, the 19th century opera excerpts in the Gregorian chant book. You know, I mean, in terms of like the 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 uh, appropriateness. Yeah. I don't know. Tiffany, what did you think of this? Uh, I didn't make it through the whole thing, I have to say. <laughs> It was too cringy. Like, too what cringy. is this? Let's try and translate this to a different genre. Like, like let's let's take a generation mm. step back into like the first emo or like metal kind of music videos. That's the feel of this stuff to me. Where it's like there's like some sort of deep set like angst thing that people are trying to tap into. But like this is not cool enough for that. Okay, like it just ends up being. It ends up reading like a parody. It ends up reading like comedy instead of this sort of, I mean, on on a level, if you sort of lighten up a bit and like suspend your disbelief, you can watch early generation metal music videos without necessarily thinking, you can think that they're funny, but you can also take them for what they are. This I can't take for what it is. I have such a hard time. Like what, what am I supposed to like, am I supposed to be laughing? Well, I'm laughing at it yeah but that's, that's I mean. not it does not invite laughter with it like th this is no this is taking itself very seriously extremely right? seriously you know i would contrast this with like glenn gould you know, we're, we're sort of on similar territory. I mean, Glenn Gould loved Bach. He loved, you know, talking about these composers and like completing their stuff and whatever. But Glenn Gould, like there is a he's a little bit in on the joke, at mm -hmm. least. And there's a lot of people who think that he's totally in on, on the joke. As serious as he comes off, like there is some bit of self-parody in there. Mm -hmm. Whereas with this, I, I don't think so. I think that this is supposed to be authentically like a serious artiste. 
Yeah, this statement. is leaning in way too hard with not even the slightest amount of irony, which is just what makes it so... I mean, it was really rather hard to bear. <laughs> Do you guys think that this is more DG directed or Daniel Trifonov directed? I don't know, man. He's doing the acting in here. You know, I mean, he's the one that's pacing like a madman and, you know, wearing this stuff and going out and like writing music with leaves in the woods. I think like... it's him directed. That's if I had to, if I had to guess, yeah, no, it's yeah. Just, you know, and it would be just the sort of thing where, uh, you know, DG, but it could be anybody, any organization would be like, well, maybe it'll go viral, you know, like, because people don't really know why things take off. I mean, everyone's just putting their things out into the world, not knowing at any point wh whether something will be popular or not. And th I feel like, especially as we watch the older generation who is in charge of these organizations try and confront the newer generation where something might go viral overnight on TikTok, literally it feels like random. It feels like we are just throwing things out into the wind. And so if somebody came and said, oh, what if we make music with leaves here? We're like, yeah, let's try it. You know, like <laughs> we just don't know how far off the cliff. Let's let's put it in, let's put it in the context of uh, another music video that we watched recently. Um, Jakub Yosef Orl Orlinsky's um, very much video, in conversation. Right? <laughs> yeah, hmm. uh, that's an interesting counterpoint, Kensho, because I'm now wondering, like the Trifonov video seems so over the top that you can't believe that he wasn't so cognizant or like kind of in on the joke. But somehow that other video is even more over the top to where you feel like they couldn't have not been in on the joke. Right. I don't know. Is there more, is so, there's, there's somehow, some way feels like there's more, there's somehow more self-awareness in Orlansky's video, even though they are even more over the top, like yeah. the murder scene and all this stuff. But clearly, clearly there is an attention to at least an awareness of, of the value of creating music videos to accompany classical music. Do you guys see this being like the, the thing now is like, you know, with classical music now, like what, 30 years behind everybody else, <laughs> like it, realizing like, oh, with an album release, we should put out a music video too. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's the next, this is the thing now. This is definitely the thing, especially with, with, with European record labels and ensembles. You know, you, you don't nearly see it as much with American stuff. But yeah, in Europe, this is it. I mean, mostly what you're getting are very cool videos of recording sessions and that I'm super into. Like, yeah. I, I like that a lot. I mean, you know, there's, well, we've we've watched a number of videos of like, you know, my people, Leia Desandre and the Jupiter Ensemble, but like there was a... Well, the one with Natalie Stutzmann, right? She Yeah, Na yeah, yeah Natalie Stutzmann. Recording. Right, She's yeah. Really I, th cool. I think the early music ensembles have sort of spearheaded this because they are more like bands anyway. Mm -hmm. And now it's... Uh, yeah, now it's reaching into a lot of different realms. I figured out what I why I find this so objectionable. Actually, it's because it feels snobby to me. Like it's mm -hmm. leaning into some like I identities that people already think about classical musicians, and like it's not helping. Like you are not helping. <laughs> we are not manic musical geniuses stranded in the woods, uh, you know, scribbling down thoughts on paper and thinking that we're above the world t and that there's no way anybody will ever understand this. Like that that's not. That's already something that we're in danger of people thinking. And so leaning into this with this degree of seriousness, I think I'm re having an aller allergic reaction to that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I mean, this does, I think, pick up on like, I don't know if you guys watched a lot of um, like conductor documentaries in the 90s. Mm. I mean, this is very much what I grew up on. And every single one was like, an old European white dude walking through the woods. There always has to be a walking through the woods scene. Mm -hmm. uh, Abado, even Boulez, like the guy who you would think spent the least amount of time in any woods, <laughs> anywhere. They, you know, he would be walking through the woods. Tielemann, always walking through the woods. And I think that this is like the ne plus ultra of that. Did you guys have any thoughts about his actual completion? Okay, so I am not like the guy to talk about this, but uh, one, one of our friends, listener Marcello, who's a, a very close friend of mine, he uh, weighed in on this. I, I asked him what he thought about it because he's super horny for counterpoints in a way that, you know, I'm just <laughs> not really. Um, anyway, he says that um, he was not impressed with, with the actual completion itself. He said that um, he combines um, the, the second subject with the first subject, an episode combining the main subject with the art of fugue, and the rest is snippets of subjects and some free-floating materials of his invention vaguely related to the subjects. 
He does not combine all four subjects, if I am not mistaken. And so, I mean, you know, listener Marcello said that, like, in the more successful completions, the art of fugue subject, when it enters, it has this very dramatic weight to it. And we don't get that at all in this. Yeah, it kind of just floated in and out and now it was kind of over, wasn't it? There was never like a high point to the fugue, which you kind of wait for in these kind of massive architectural structures. I had a feeling, you know, and I, I did dig up the sheet music to see where the, because I, I don't, I'm not super familiar with the piece, so I didn't know exactly where Bach started and he began. But afterwards, I did like put the score away and listen to it again. And mind you, I was listening without watching. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can tell the the moment, like within the, I would say for you, you know, maybe t- ten seconds plus or minus at at the very, even if you didn't know the piece, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't love that. It says to me that you know at this moment he chose to insert himself in a way that was not necessarily flattering. And I think the way that I would describe most of the actual completion, and m- maybe uh, listener Marcello's comment reinforces, or is a better way of uh, technically explaining why, but it feels vague mm. to me. It feels washy, mm. and it feels overpedaled, and it feels <laughs> it feels like an improvisation, actually. Mm. <laughs> um, which I don't, you know, there's, there's an improvisatory quality to some, but like, fugues are so highly constructed. Bach obviously cared about this work so much. Like, I don't think that this is just a casual kind of thing. And it felt like, it felt vague and it felt casual to me. And like, God, the pedaling, there was so much pedal. All of a sudden, there was a lot of pedal. Mm-hmm. There isn't much in the first half, like during the box stuff. And all of a sudden, it's like a wash with like kind of this romantic, and there's like a, like tons of rubato all of a sudden. I don't know. It was It was really obvious to me. Isn't that the moment where like he gets in a bath? There's some kind of like water... <laughs> moment and that's like exactly where like the sound gets super pedally oh, isn't that interesting. am i imagining that i'll say this much he needed a bath <laughs> that's for damn sure <laughs> just just or just like get under those nails a little bit i don't know ooh, it was ooh, a little, i know yeah it's a lot a lot going on under there yeah all right well listeners um yeah take take a quick look at this and let us know what you think and um please um you know especially th- these days please exercise uh, good Hygiene, hygiene of your hands. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. William, on to our third topic. As a means of introduction to our final topic, have a listen to this headline from KGW8, local news in Portland, Oregon. Fred Meyer will stop blasting classical music from loudspeakers in the parking lot at some stores overnight after complaints from neighbors. Several neighbors living near the Gateway Fred Meyer in northeast Portland told KGW on Wednesday they were fed up with the music, calling it both irritating and inhumane. On Friday, the grocery chain said it will be turning it off moving forward. It had admitted earlier in the week that it had recently started to play the classical music at select store locations to discourage illegal and dangerous activity. Now, I came across this article just because I used to live in Portland, and I try to keep current on the news there. But this is just one example of a phenomenon that's been around for decades. In researching the topic, I came across examples of classical music being used as a weapon against vagrancy in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Anchorage, and indeed in Seattle, where I currently reside. So guys, um, in digging a little deeper into this, I found that apparently the first use of classical music as an anti-vagrancy weapon was in Canada, actually, in 1985. And it was to uh, try to get some teens off of the, uh, the, you know, the area in front of like a drugstore or something, or maybe, maybe it was also a grocery store. Had you guys come across this phenomenon before, either just reading about it or have you seen this in the wild? I have a feeling that it's possible that I've come across it in the wild without necessarily paying much attention to it. You know, it's not that unusual for, for you to walk around outside the shopping centers and maybe hear something on, on some sort of um, loudspeaker of some sort. So I, I can't quite say whether I have a specific impression of this as a tactic, which in the end I feel is probably the right way to approach this. And my basic feeling about the tactic as a whole is that the people who employ it seem to often get confused as to the two possible mechanisms by which it works. One, are you trying to create an environment that is somehow inimitable to 
certain kinds of behaviors by some sort of weird psychological environment kind of nudging? Mm -hmm. Or two, are you trying to annoy people into going away? Mm -hmm. And I think, peop I think that Fred Meyer's chief mistake here is not having any idea of which one of the two he's trying to do. Or rather, thinking that something that is meant to do something is more the former and using it as something to do more of the latter. Oh, but I think that this is clearly trying to disturb and annoy people and get them away because I mean That's right. But th there was the video clip where, you know, they were talking to the neighbors and the neighbors who live across the street from this Fred Meyer with their door closed. They could hear I mean this was loud. This That's was right. aggressive. Yeah. So I think that if you took everybody who employs this tactic and ask them the question of how do you think this works, then you're either going to get the answer of people who hear this music are less likely to engage in these disagreeable behaviors. Or two, people who hear music at a certain volume or up are going to be so annoyed <laughs> that they're going to leave, right? So, and, and I think that it's important for people who think that this is a good tactic to know exactly which one of those tactics they're trying to employ. Because when you, once you get confused, I mean, the primary question is, why classical music? And when you're getting to like this volume thing where you're going to play something at a loud enough decibel level to annoy people, then I don't think that there is a good reason why classical music. That, that has nothing to do with each other. But somehow, and this happens all the time in marketing, the tactic, play music at off hours, is confused if you don't know which, which one of these avenues you're trying to do, get. I mean, it's clearly a volume thing, right? Like, just, just make it loud enough that it annoys people. It doesn't really matter what music it is. It just happened to be that the first person that did it up in Canada chose classical music. Don't you think? But it has been other things before. Yeah, no, but Tiffany, you, you get to a good point here. Is that like, yeah, we've all been to like, you know, an outdoor shopping mall where there's like light jazz often or light classical. And they're just trying to create, uh, you know, what they consider like an upscale mood, which might draw in a clientele versus just blasting something like was done in Guantanamo Bay to prisoners when they're like trying to torture them, mm -hmm. which is all just a matter of volume. And classical music, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's funny how the two have gotten grafted onto each other. Yeah. Because another, another approach with this is not playing music at all, but there are some places, they have this thing called the mosquito, and yep. that plays a high pitch that can only be heard by people under the age of 30. And dogs, probably. Right, and, and poor dogs. In that case, there have been lawsuits, you know, for anti-age discrimination. So yeah, they, but the question of why classical is crazy. And then the question is like, does this actually work? And what does it mean for it to work? And I think that we need to, yeah, focus on the idea of the weaponization of sound and of this classical music in particular. I don't know, just the, the whole idea that like we would be trying to make our public spaces worse for people, it, it's just awful. You know, it's very tied to this idea of hostile architecture where benches have spikes on them and stuff so that like, you know, poor homeless people can't like lay down or and, and just even non-homeless people, just anybody like we should be trying to improve the quality of our public spaces, not degrade them. Let's say that you were able to do this without making it inimitable in some way to, in a general aesthetic sense. So yesterday I was walking around an outdoor shopping mall and on the benches <laughs> there are these like sculptures, it's like um, green sculptures of, of whatever, figures. They all look like people, but like they are, there are sculptures taking up like a third of this bench. and. The more I thought about it, the more it's like, yeah, obviously that is put there to discourage people from sleeping on these benches, mm -hmm. right? So, but they are aesthetically not offensive, we'll mm -hmm. say, although they did scare me out of the corner of my eye every time I thought I was seeing a person there and it wasn't. <laughs> but laying that aside, I would venture to say people's use of classical music is kind of akin to this, where, you're, where, where you have a mission that is at its heart kind of anti-human, but you're trying to dress it up in something that is generally not offensive. So is it more just like that they use classical music as like an excuse for it? Like, oh, like this is bad, but you know, we're playing classical music. But the good music, people so. will like it. 
Right. Right. Yeah. Right. The yeah. kinds and, of people we like, want here are not going to object. Right. And, and you know, we're playing it in this Fred Lyer parking lot. Well, the neighbors, you know, why should they care? I mean, it's just beautiful classical music. You know, what objection could these people have to, to hearing classical music? Well, you know? and it's every, like, I would say, like, he's so, so dumb. It's, 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 it's completely possible that if he had just, like, played it at a lower volume, nobody would ever have said anything that's exactly right but then it it's wouldn't so have, it, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have uh, achieved its objective i mean look especially on the west coast and i know that this is now more commonly um found in in many american cities like i know that there were people in this parking lot who were living in trailer homes uh, on the street right next to it and there is drug activity that goes on in these encampments and there's probably tents popping up there too and that's what they're trying to get rid of i mean this is just trying to foist a problem onto somebody else because it's a problem that we will not collectively come together to solve at a root level, which is homelessness and housing and the creation of uh, community spaces. We don't want to do the hard work, so you're just trying to make it somebody else's problem. And obviously the real victims here are like, the neighbors, both the housed and unhoused neighbors and the people who are like trying to shop in this community and the community members. But you know what? Classical music ends up being a little bit of a uh, collateral of a damage Collateral damage here. Yeah. I mean, this is like this isn't good for our brand. I mean, yeah. you talk about like, you know, uh, Daniel Trifonov making a video that makes, you know, leans into all of the worst elitist tropes about classical music. I mean, this enters into that conversation as well, don't, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, you know, it's not necessarily fair to say that the victims are everyone who has to listen to it and not the people who are, like, are driven to try and find anti-vagrancy measures to protect their small businesses from playing host to vagrants. Like, I don't, I, like, they are also victims in this. I mean, the whole, the whole community is, you know, and that's why we need, like, tremendous community-wide investment reimagining of our housing policy. I don't know. I've become like a big urbanist, urbanist guy uh, in the past couple of years. So like, well, when they open the public housing facility, we're going to have a lot of reparations to do. So it's all it's it's it's, it's going to be playing classical music at acceptable volumes in socially attractive situations and with for people in, in a situation which uh, which, in which they will them. not begrudge their attention. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's we want classical music to be something that people like. My God, not this. If this guy was, you know, if, if Fred Meyer, if, if Fred Meyer was playing, like, I don't know, like, what, what would be a little bit more cacophonous than, let's say, like, you know, because most of these places play like Bach or Vivaldi or stuff. I like, know, I know. You would think that they would have gone with, you know, the 12-tone school here. I yeah. mean, you would think that they would be blasting yeah. Webern and, and, well, Hindemith, maybe not Webern, but... Bad Spa Orchestra. Yeah, yeah, Bad Spa one. Orchestra, right. Yeah. yeah, bring it back to the... To oh, the my favorite. Here. But speaking about urban planning, this is the thing that this country has just failed at is like space making. Right. So yes. the, the yes. idea exactly. that the idea that the, these areas exist is actually a failure of city planning and like urban planning more than just 100%. this issue of whatever it is. That, you know, these solutions are not the solutions. It's just band-aids, as we were saying. I mean, the, and this is another thing, too, where, where there's a real conflation here. There's a conflation of this Fred Meyer wants to get rid of like what they would consider vagrants, you know, people living in their in their cars or their trailers and doing meth in the parking lot. Right. They want that away. And then there's like the soft version of this, which is we just don't want the loitering teens hanging out. <laughs> and that's predicated on the idea that that teens think that classical music is uncool. Yeah, that's so sad. I find myself more irked at news articles that summarize that point so reductively mm. yes, than yes. I am even about the tactic itself. And without even without pointing to any evidence, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, other than anecdotal, which I guess that there are probably some teens that think that classical music is not cool. Oh, give me a break. Like one of the, I mean, here's a, here's a data point that I like to share with my class often, and which by the way is primarily teens, <laughs> which is that one of the biggest surges in Spotify search terms during the pandemic was soothing piano music. Mm -hmm. Well, not very soothing here. Um, and uh, listeners, another another topic that is rife for discussion. So please, if you have thoughts about this, send them in to us, classicalgabfest at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. All right, with that, I think it's time to move on to our classical mixtape. Tiffany. In our classical mixtape, we each recommend some music that's caught our ear this week to share with our listeners. Kensho, what do you have this week? All right, so I was in Rhode Island this week, and after each performance, I did a Q&A on stage uh, for the audience that decided they wanted to stay even longer in the concert hall after mm -hmm. the show. 
And um, one of the questions I got was from a, an aspiring viol violinist. I think he was studying. And he said that as a violinist, are there pieces that you enjoy playing either just for yourself or for the audience? And I took the just for myself. And I said, uh, you know, kind of almost I regret it now. This is why I'm bringing it now <laughs> is I said like the box solo sonatas, which is super, super basic. But then I was like, oh, my God, I wish I said the Telemann fantasies because it's like the kind of lesser known solo violin pieces that I really, really love playing actually for myself. So I'm always like making a issuing a correction to my Q&A answer <laughs> and uh, suggesting, uh, well, all 12 are great, but I'm bringing the first one in B flat major. And this particular performance is by a violinist that I know, actually, uh, Shunsuke Sato. Great. Yeah, that sounds like an uh, excellent Bach alternative. <laughs> Will, what do you have next? Okay, this is by an American composer named John Alden Carpenter, and it is a piano work titled Diversions. It is a series of five miniatures. Uh, comes from the year 1923. The composer himself lived from 1876 to 1951. He was from Illinois. He was educated at Harvard, studied under John Knowles Payne, one of these kind of uh, American composers named that you read in textbooks, but nobody ever hears their music. And this I thought was interesting. His, his like great ambition in life was to study composition with Edward Elgar, which like I... <laughs> Of all the people who are around in, you know, 1890s, 1900 or whatever, I mean, I've never heard of anybody else, you know, really just like lusting to, to study with uh, Edward Elgar. But this guy did. But his music, to me, doesn't sound like Elgar at all. It sounds more like very refined, like a better version of Eric Satie. So um, here, here's the opening of this uh, Diversions piece. And to wrap up our mixtape for today, I am bringing a Stokowski orchestration of a WC piano piece. This is the Sunken Cathedral, played here by Jeffrey Simon and the Philharmonia Orchestra. Stokowski orchestrations. I, I just really enjoy them. I know that they're a little campy sometimes and they're a little jagged in others, but like I love them and I want to know where to get more of them because frankly they're a little hard to find. 
But yeah, anyway. but there can't be in the best way. But I had no yeah. idea that he did Debussy orchestrations. Oh, it's so good. Oh, this and one is makes, this one's amazing. It's one of it my favorite a, ones. Hmm. Yeah, it makes it a its own piece. I think it's in its own right in a way hmm. that some of his orchestrations, other ones, don't do quite as well. They're in the most illegible score in parts. Someone yes. has to re-engrave them. Yes. But this one's really special. You'll find the links to all these and to our full classical mixtape playlist in the show notes. And with that, it's time to wrap up this episode of the Classical Gap Fest. I'm Kensho Watanabe, and on behalf of Tiffany Liu and William White, I'd like to thank you so much for listening and to encourage you to subscribe and rate us on your podcast app. We'd also love your help spreading the word about the show on social media, where you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can reach us at classicalgabfest at gmail.com, and we'd love to hear from you. Until next time, happy listening, and we'll be with you next week. Thank you.